What we are experiencing are the inevitable consequences of digital technology. I'm afraid that capitalism is not sustainable. I want to hear the bankers and the others saying that's got to be reformed. I want to bring meaning back into the study of economics. What does the, it mean for changing how we relate to one another? I just think, what, what do economists mean when they say capitalism? And the answer is, economists don't say capitalism. We don't use that word really. As, as, and, um, and I think there's a reason, which is that what people seem to mean when they talk about capitalism is three not necessarily uh, connected things. There's some association between them, but they're not the same thing. Uh, one of them is markets, relying on on decentralized, re relying on, on prices to tell people what to produce, what to do, um, as opposed to uh, telling them what to do. Um, the second is the notion that your individual standard of living, your purchasing power, is, uh, is determined by what you can sell yourself or what you own on the market. Um, and the third is that the big determinant of how much you have, of how, how rich you are, if you like, is how much in the way of assets you own. So th there's, there are these three things, market economies, uh, market incomes as being basically what income is, is about, and the third is, is capital in the sense of that, that, the, that, that being a capitalist is how you are a person of uh, exceptional uh, wealth and, and status and power. Um, and the thing is, in all three respects, we only sort of, kind of, partially live under capitalism in any of those senses. Uh, so if you ask about markets, and this is something where I, I'm just as, uh, uh, one of the fu funny things about market fundamentalists is that they, their image of the, the economy we live in tends to be one in which it's all individuals freely contracting with each other, and good God, I mean, uh, the, that's, that's not the way most people live. Um, and the last bit about capital, I mean, how do we, uh, where does, let's say, private equity managers? fit into the, the notion of capitalism as being the, who owns the capital. Uh, because those are, you know, they, they, they are certainly very wealthy and very powerful, powerful enough to buy themselves in the United States a extraordinary tax privilege. Um, it's not based on what they own exactly. Uh, they're ma allegedly managing other people's money. Uh, and yet they are, well, the favorite statistic is that the 25 top uh, equity managers uh, earn about three times as much as, uh, as the uh, 250,000 school teachers in New York. Um, so it's, it's quite a, uh, a lot of, um, sorry, it's 80,000 school teachers. I'm, I'm merging my, anyway, you, you get the picture. It's enormously concentration, which is not exactly capitalism. Even Piketty um, concedes, I mean, not concedes, he, he, he knows. And um, for, for the United States, for the Anglo-Saxon countries, Britain as well, the, um, uh, the vast increase in inequality so far has been mostly about, uh, about compensation. Uh, it has been about fees and, and bonuses and, and not about capital income. Capital income is growing, and that there's a very powerful argument in Piketty's book that it will continue to grow, that we are on our way to becoming a patrimonial society, but we are not now. At the moment, we're not that kind of thing. So um, I, I think that actually in some ways, the, the Phrasing this in terms of capitalism is the way we're going to put it. The question is, could we have something that is substantially different from what we do now, should we? Um, and my answer is, sort of. What we've got today is a system of rentier capitalism where all the economic rules that I learned as a student at Cambridge have broken down. It used to be the case that the share of national income going to capital and the share going to labor were roughly constant over time. But across the world, in country after country, including China, in the United States, and most other countries, the share going to capital has gone up, the share going to labor has gone down. But more importantly than that, the share going to the rentiers, the people who have property and assets, financial, physical or intellectual, has been shooting up. 
Let me give you one or two key statistics which indicate a system in crisis. It used to be the case that private wealth in this country in the 1970s was worth about 300% of GDP. Today, private wealth is 700% or nearly 700% of GDP. And the inequality of wealth far exceeds the inequality of earned income. If you look further at the wealth statistics, you very quickly identify the fact that over 60% of total wealth in this country is inherited wealth. In other words, it's not been earned by production or employment or brilliance, it's inherited. And you can see the same sort of phenomenon all over the world. It's not quite the Piketty story, but then you see the breakdown of simple basic economics that we were taught at university. And it used to be the case that when productivity went up, wages went up. Not anymore. It's called the opening of the jaws of the snake. So when profits have gone up or productivity have gone up, average wages have tended to fall. Real wages in France, in Germany, in the United States have been static and falling for the precariat, the group that I've been writing about, for the last 30 years. This is a system in systemic crisis. And this is why our politics are also in crisis, because the basic economics that we were taught, if you work hard, your incomes will go up. That's not the case anymore. Millions of people work damn hard, and they're not making anything worthy of a, a decent life. Pandemic is a global phenomenon. Those uh, nasty viruses don't carry passports and visas. And if you are sicker, it's more likely that more of your population, if you're not as healthy because you're poorer, more of your population will come down with the, the disease and that will be a vector for spreading the disease around the world. Migration is a problem that Europe has faced. Migration pressure will increase the greater the divide between the rich and the poor. So there are so many aspects of our well-being in the advanced countries uh, that are interdependent with what is going on in the developing and emerging markets and in countries outside our borders uh, that we have to think about this from a, a global uh, perspective. I wanted to comment on one particular aspect of this. That's why we have to have global rules that serve the interest of the whole world. And uh, one part of that problem is that a lot of those rules have been written not to serve our interest in the developed countries or the interest of the developing countries. They've been uh, designed to serve corporate interests uh, in the United States and Europe, but not the interest of ordinary people, of workers, uh, or of the developing countries. So there's go back to a lot, uh, the theme I talked about, a lot of exploitation. So part of the problem is that what has been going on has been that uh, corporate interests have taken advantage of emerging markets, developing countries, but not in ways that advantage the citizens in general in our countries, but just advantage themselves. And that's, uh, Lisa referred to, to uh, uh, the debt trap diplomacy of China, and it's clearly true, but it's also true in the advanced countries. Yeah. Uh, we have not done uh, what uh, we should do to discourage the excess of lending to poor countries with uh, outrageous conditions. And one aspect of that is very important. In 2015, the United Nations uh, set forth a set of principles for debt restructuring. A lot of countries get over indebted, sometimes because they were encouraged to get more debt. Um, and when you face that excess of debt, 
Domestically, we have bankruptcy courts, the set of principles. Internationally, we don't have that. Overwhelmingly, the countries around the world voted to a set of principles for, debt, for, for sovereign debt restructuring. There were just a couple countries, six countries, that voted against. The United States was one. I think UK was another. Um, and I hope that changes uh, because of the lack of a mechanism for restructuring this debt. Uh, a lot of countries around the world are suffering. And the absence of that allows the financial sector to exercise enormous amount of power, squeeze rent, the poorest countries, and that encourages them not to do the due diligence and to lend excessively. So it, it really is, we, don't, we can see it on the part of China as it engages in that debt diplomacy, but it's very much a part of the United States and the UK. Think about the word capitalism, and it was invented actually by the enemies of the 19th century liberals. Um, oh, that's not a that's not anywhere near a decisive argument, but it, it focuses on capital accumulation as the way that we get better off. And up really until the late 19, 1950s, then gradually over the decades after that. Most economists believed that. Adam Smith, the blessed Adam Smith, cross myself, um, believed that the Highlands of Scotland, if they would just behave themselves, could become as rich as the Dutch, which was his model of a, a uh, high income society, um, uh, if they would just save and accumulate. And that's all you needed. And this was. Uh, this was tr translated into Marxism, for example, and then in, in conventional bourgeois economics. Up, as I say, up until uh, f f 50 years ago, 70, or yeah, about 50 years ago, economists believed this. And it was the, the doctrine, for example, at the World Bank, that the way to make Ghana rich is to put lots of foreign aid into Ghana, and not one cent into red China, for example. And then Ghana would be prosperous and red China would stay poor. Well, you may have noticed that that didn't happen. Um, so sheer capital accumulation without innovation, without new ideas coming from the minds of free people, from non-slaves, is just piling up. If, if you own an auto, how would you be a lot better off if you had six autos? Of course not. Um, if you have a, an apartment, would it be nice to have 12 apartments? No. Sheer capital accumulation doesn't pay off. It, it, to express it as John Maynard Keynes did in 1936, um, the marginal efficiency of investment could be driven down to zero in a generation, which is to say that sheer piling up of what we all agree are good things like factories and roads and schools and so forth, sheer piling up doesn't do the trick. That's not what made us rich. And boy, did we become rich from innovation. 3,000% better off than in 1800. Now, this, this is, people find this number hard to believe, but it's, ask any economic historian and they'll say, yep, that's about it. 3,000% better off, not 100% or 200%, but 3,000%. And that came from innovation. So what we'd better call this system we have is not capitalism. People are terminally confused about this. Capitalism has always existed. There have always been middlemen and factories. There were factories for making uh, uh, fish sauce in Rome. Uh, there are factories to make uh, silk cloth in China from ancient times. No, it's innovation that was peculiar. Google discovered what may be the last virgin wood. 
and that turns out to be our private experience. Google claimed our private experience as free raw material to be translated into behavioral data. <coughs> These data would be collected from every domain. It began online, as you all know, but it now reaches far beyond online. Who's got an Alexa in their kitchen? Who's got a TV that listens? Who's walking down the street, not only passing the CCTV cameras, which are public sector, but the tech companies have fought for the right to be able to take our faces from any public space without our ever knowing. Forget about consent. Forget about the right to combat. So now these data are being amassed. They are valued for their rich predictive signals. They are shunted into complex supply chains of data flows. They are conveyed, picture those old-fashioned conveyor belts, conveying them right into a factory. But what is this factory? It's a computational factory. It's called AI, artificial intelligence. But like any factory, it makes products. In this case, it makes prediction products. What's computed are predictions of our behavior. Turns out there are a lot of businesses who have a keen interest in knowing what we will do soon and later. First to sell us targeted ads, but it doesn't stop there. There are all kinds of reasons to know what we will do in the future. What price to sell us their service or their product? Whether or not to give us an insurance policy and at what level of cost? Whether or not to give us a mortgage or a bank loan? There are lots and lots of reasons they want to be able to predict our behavior. How are we going to drive? That, to, you know, that can influence what our auto insurance look like. There are many, many issues and they, they arise in every single economic sector. Part of my thesis is that from 2009 onwards, the role that profits used to play in fueling the engine that pulled capitalism ahead was profits were replaced by central bank money. And you can see that most of the important, the most important companies of the last 10, 15 years don't really make profits. If you look at Uber, Airbnb, Netflix, Spotify, Tesla, very little profits, if any, if any. What drives them is uh, a stock exchange where their shares are going through the roof. And why are the shares going through the roof? Because central banks have been printing the money to make sure that the financial markets remain in rude health. The second pillar, markets, they are on the way out. And I've already explained why. Because command capital has risen to such an extent that not only does it tell us what we want, but it also creates the platforms on which we can actually buy that which they tell us that we want. And remember, these are not markets, they're platforms. The moment you enter Amazon.com, you have exited capitalism. In the same way that the moment you walk into the, the Google campus in California, um, you exit capitalism because you enter a centrally planned organization with a complete hierarchy. There's no market in Google. In the same way, there is no market in General Motors. There is no market in Volkswagen. The moment you enter the factory, there's no market there. It's like, you know, a Stalinist organization. <laughs> Maybe it's quite pleasant, but it's still a hierarchical, top-down, non-market organization. The moment you enter Amazon.com, remember, there is one person that owns the algorithm that determines once you are in Amazon.com, what you see, what you, you know, what you can buy, what you can't buy, what you can't see. Some people see one thing, other people see another thing. It's this algorithm that determines that. This is not a market. This is like a feudal estate, a fiefdom, only it's a digital one, a digital fiefdom. What we have is a new kind of capital, which I call command capital, that um, has given rise to a new ruling class, the cloud lists, with traditional capitalists becoming subsumed, becoming a vassal class vis-a-vis -vis the cloud lists. You have the replacement of profit making with central bank money, which creates new ways of telling people what you do, what to do, 
Yeah? Because if you are Elon Musk, for instance, uh, your capacity to make the world go round um, draws from the value of your shares, of the shares of Tesla, of SpaceX, and so on. And that, the, 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 those values are not that much related to profit at all. They're related to the um, state money the central banks are printing, as well as to the command capital. Um, we were just talking about a, a friend of mine, Francesca Bria, who's one of a, a visiting scholars at the Institute I run at UCL. She was the chief digital officer in Barcelona for the mayor, Ada Colau. And they really, I think, did a very interesting uh, think about this whole kind of value generation with the tech companies. Because if you don't, again, focus on where is value coming from, and you just are constantly catching up with the problems that might arise from this distorted notion of who the wealth creators are, then the state, in this case the city, will always just be kind of coming to the problem afterwards. Oh, we have to tax the company. Oh my God, privacy. Just kind of always catching up with the situation. Um, and what they did in Barcelona was, or Barcelona, I keep saying it the Italian way, Barcelona, Barcelona, uh, was to say, why don't we start thinking about building like a public repository where every time you click on, say, City Mapper, the data that's generated, because data isn't static, it's generated through activity, actually goes back to a publicly governed repository, which then has direct effects, direct benefits to public transport, for example. Right? So, and if companies want access to this data, which we as cities are generating through uh, our use of apps to get around the city, then they might have to either pay into it or sign up to certain types of conditions. But anyway, just really, instead of just catching up with the problem, rethinking the value proposition itself of how to set up a more symbiotic system. Um, so what to do? First of all, this is not about saying where is value created versus where is it extracted. It just means really bringing back that notion to the center and not saying things like, you know, finance is terrible, but how can we fundamentally and radically reform the way that the financial sector operates in order to steer it, bring it back into, what the classicals used to call the production boundary. And this could be through really obvious things that, you know, it's really not rocket science, but things like the um, financial transaction tax, right, to make it uh, less profitable to do millisecond trades versus long run trades that was put forth after the financial crisis and has not been adopted widely. It could also be about setting up new types of institutions, mutuals, cooperatives, public banks themselves, which are more long termist and actually provide capital development for the economy itself instead of the way that finance has recently just kind of been financing itself. But it really does, I think, in essence, require us to go back and ask, what does it mean to talk about value as collectively produced? Because this is, in fact, what's happening now. This notion of stakeholder value has come back as the concept of shareholder value is being talked about even in places like Davos as a problem. We all of a sudden talk again about stakeholder value which means that you worry about all the different actors you know, in the system that need to also be invested in. And if you read that letter, or even Larry Fink's letter, I think in 2008, the head of BlackRock also said that. But that's going to be impossible to do unless we go back to first principles and really rethink both the accounting systems, things like GDP, but also what is the underlying notion of where this value was created in the first place, as opposed to just thinking, oh, we'll do some handouts to the communities, or yes, we'll pay our workers a bit more. Um, if we don't actually believe that workers or the state or different types of organizations also in civil society are active co-creators of value, it's just not going to happen. Cryptocurrencies and so on, and I will definitely add, uh, I love them in a terrified way. The Wall Street bets and all that stuff, you know. These are signs of a gradual disintegration of capitalism as we know it. And as always, I'm here a Marxist pessimist with elements of optimism. It's an open situation. That's why I don't think we are in a medical emergency. Uh, we should now forget about politics. We live now in perhaps a most politicized moment in our lives, more than 68. Things are really changing. Look at Germany also. Uh, now at this moment, of course, with all the counterattacks, it will probably uh, uh, lose some points. The strongest party in Germany is the Green Party. And the right-wingers are already 
basically openly saying better alternative for Germany, they are eco-socialists, they are the greatest danger, and so on and so on. It's incredible what is happening. And my hope is this one. We have the populist new populist new right and new corporate, neo-feudal, whatever, capitalism. And we should appeal to liberals and tell them you are losing. The only way liberalism can be saved in the sense of redeeming, uh, maintaining what is worth fighting for, human freedoms, blah, blah, all the things that we like, is to make a leftward spin, you know, to move to the left. The, uh, uh, because in some paradoxical sense, you remember how both Donald Trump and his European version, Viktor Orban from Hungary, draw a totally new political mapping for them, or as Orban says, I love this passage, he said, uh, there are no liberals, there, it's only us, right-wing populists and communists. Liberals are just, his expression, communists with a diploma, you know. Uh, Trump said the same. He said, Biden, Kamala Harris, these are socialist communists, and so on. And my bet is that in some sense they are partially right. No, it's crazy to say that Biden is a communist, but we should strategically support what some of the measures of what Biden and Kamala Harris are doing now. Why? Not as old communists who say, well, but we have a secret plot to take over, but we should just catch them by the, their work, how do you put it? You know, like, if you really mean what you are doing, you will be obliged to make further steps and further steps in the future, and so on and so on. We live, again, in a quite unique moment where, on the one hand, the danger is this short-term pragmatism. Yeah, that's all we can do. But the danger is also fake radicalism, which means something that I like to call a radical principle opportunism, you know, in a situation where you can, through strategic support of some even existing measure, you can gain points and say, no, no, this is not yet the true revolution, let's wait. It's a principle position which is very comfortable because this means, let me sit back in my academic safe chair and let's wait. No, now it's not the time to wait. 